It's been about nine months, I think, since the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Commandant and the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command signed the, the w signed out the white paper mm -hmm. that uh, talked about an exploration of the idea of strategic land power. Yeah. Um, can you talk about where that stands now, um, mm -hmm. what you think are some of the things that you've learned over the last l nine months and where it's headed? Sure. <clears throat> so the this idea of strategic land power uh, really came out of a number of different uh, drivers. And it, it kind of manifests itself uh, in a conversation between General Odierno and uh, Admiral Craven, the SOCOM commander. And it was, it's a recognition uh, that we can't let the hard won lessons of the last 10 years, 13 years, uh, slip away first. And in that regard, uh, they, of course, engaged the Commandant of the Marine Corps because, you know, the three forces that, although they're each uh, constituted for a different purpose, those purposes all converge at the end of the day on land, and we invariably wind up working uh, in and amongst each other as we work, as you noted, in and amongst the people. <clears throat> so one key driver. Uh, another key driver, again, from the last uh, you know, decade plus of, of uh, war, is that a recognition that uh, tactical excellence uh, does not always translate to strategic uh, outcomes. And so our operational capabilities, uh, while uh, very effective in direct combat, have not always delivered, on the, necess delivered the necessary outcomes uh, to move uh, to the objectives that we've entered conflict for. And, and so there's a recognition that we have to work at getting the Army in particular, but the Marine Corps and, and Special Ops, a posture to be a strategic instrument that actually delivers on strategic outcomes and not just an operationally useful force. Uh, so that was a, a key component. A third aspect was the, the recognition that, quite frankly, uh, we've strayed away from our understanding of warfare. And, and by that, what I mean by that is, uh, at the end of the day, and you know, Sun Tzu talks about it, so this is not purely a, a, a you know, Eurocentric idea that came from Clausewitz. It is about you know, perceiving yourself and perceiving the enemy, and if you do, do so correctly, uh, you will win a thousand victories. And that was Sun Tzu's idea. And then, of course, uh, Clausewitz, uh, many centuries later, laid out the fact that War is an extension of politics by other means, and of course politics is the interaction of, of human will, and war is a clash of wills. Uh, we kind of lost focus on that over the 1990s. We lost uh, our understanding that at the end of the day, it's not the physical objectives, it's not the success in the, in the execution of physical tasks that matter, it's their impact on the will of the people you're trying to influence. So. And it doesn't have to be just about uh, you know, the visiting of violence on people, although that's certainly what we, at the end of the day, exist for. Uh, but when you take physical action without fully considering uh, the uh, human objective that you want to achieve, uh, you're liable to be ineffective. Uh, and this is not just a, you know, a treatise on, on our experience in Iraq. Kosovo is a perfect study of, of exactly what I'm talking about. Because the air campaign uh, hit every target brilliantly. Some of them were not real, but that's okay. Um, and, and had absolutely no influence on the uh, Serbian population. They were completely resistant to all of the threats of violence and the acts of violence and the bombing, et cetera. And then we stopped and took a hard look at Slobodan Milosevic, who, of course, at the end of the day, was the object of all of this effort, influencing him. And we realized that threatening his population was not, or his infrastructure was not what was going to cause him to turn. And then, so we did a study on his, uh, what, what they called the crony network. So all of his supporters. So thinking more like a politician than a soldier, I suppose. And after we did that, and we understood what mattered to them, and then we started striking things that mattered to them, they then influenced him and said, hey, you're going to have to sue for peace here, buddy, because you're costing me money or you're, you're you know, I'm losing in ways that are not uh, acceptable to me. And you do that enough, and that political leader is going to begin to change his behavior. Um, we didn't undertake 
the war in Iraq with that level of understanding of uh, Saddam, certainly, and we didn't have the right understanding of the social, cultural, ethnic, uh, sectarian uh, uh, realities of, of Iraq either. And it took us a long time to gain a sense for that. And, and part of that uh, is, you know, we spent 10 years looking at Iraq, but mostly counting things, not understanding the people. And, and that's a, uh, not something that's solely limited to the soldiers, <coughs> leader, you know, military uh, leaders. Um, you know, the uh, Kerr report that the CIA did uh, has a great kind of two conclusions, which I think are very illustrative, speaking mostly about po uh, the policymakers, but also uh, senior military leaders. Their analytical intelligence that was uh, de uh, developed by uh, people who understood social, cultural issues, populations, et cetera, and had spent decades, in some cases, studying Iraq and Arab uh, tribal issues and things like that, uh, was almost uh, probably about 60, 40, 70, 30 right, and was almost always dismissed by senior leaders. Conversely, the technical intelligence, which was probably 40, 60 right or 60 percent wrong, uh, was almost always accepted by the policymakers. And so we were making decisions based on things we could see, not an understanding of the people we were trying to deal with. So in the execution of the invasion of Iraq, we perfectly executed the plan, hit all the objectives, struck all the targets, et cetera, got to Baghdad, statue fell, and then we were there for seven more years because it, it took us that long to understand what, what we really had to do to influence the population. And it started with our, our misunderstanding of Saddam's priorities. You know, there's a great uh, study uh, done by another think tank, sorry, Ida, in, you know, in conjunction with Joint Forces Command when it still existed, called Iraqi Perspectives. And they go through Saddam's, you know, kind of list of priorities. And so you often, you know, certainly in the early days, well, why didn't Saddam confess he didn't have weapons of mass destruction? Because we weren't his number one priority. His number one priority were the Iranians. His number two priority was maintaining his own position within Iraq and having weapons of mass destruction was a big, you know, that was a coup stick for him to have. And his number three priority was deterring the Israelis. And I think we were four or five on the, you know, so we were down there in his uh, list of, but we didn't understand that. We had no understanding of that. Had we had done that, we might have uh, been able to do something in a different way and been smarter about it. So how is this manifesting itself right. in strategic land power? Mm -hmm. So as you know, they wrote a white paper, and I just the first thing I want to say is the fact that the chief of staff of the Army, the commandant of the Marine Corps, and the commander of U.S. OCOM all signed the same document is progress. So. And, it, and part of that's manifest, as I say, of that, that experience of being uh, more closely intertwined over the last 10 years. Um, and since then, we have uh, been exploring you know, a little more quietly than, than what we did last year as we rolled this idea out, uh, the, the uh, underlying ideas to develop a concept that we can all align against and begin to uh, work through the process. Because uh, in order for us to uh, get after particularly this understanding of the human, you know, centered nature of conflict, uh, whether it's violent conflict or just, uh, you know, deterrence or whatever it may be, uh, we're going to have to get our act together. When I say ours, I'm talking about the military, and then we're going to have to get, the conceptual space allows us to have a discussion without getting into uh, some of the challenges that doctrine often provides us. And if we can gain a consensus through that process, then developing doctrine will be important. Uh, a little easier, I believe. And then once we have a doctrinal foundation, we'll be in a better position to advocate for uh, a stronger consideration of this in strategy and policy documents and direction that we get back. And, and that, I think, is probably the most important long-term outcome of this is to rebalance our thinking in that regard. So uh, we have a uh, the beginnings of a, of a concept that we I uh, think we'll publish uh, early next year. Uh, it is really built around uh, two big ideas uh, beyond this human piece that I've already talked about. And one is that we've got to be uh, persistently engaged around the world. And we call that maneuvering strategically. 
And so you've got to uh, invest in the places that are important to you, and in some cases, the places that are not. The relative level of investment, obviously, is going to be driven by interest. But the more that you're out there in that environment, particularly uh, given uh, some of the trends that I talked about earlier, and especially this interconnection of people, there's a lot of noise in the global community. And so being down at the local and regional level allows you to uh, separate the signal from the noise and maybe anticipate problems or better develop uh, partners in a particular region to take care of problems for themselves. Uh, that interaction and understanding, that acculturation that I talked about, <clears throat> uh, should then uh, allow us to develop leaders and eventually our senior most leaders or sustain the, the understanding we have today in, in ways where we uh, are able to uh, give better military advice at the most senior levels, uh, develop uh, more uh, or better informed plans, plans that are developed uh, based on our a better understanding of the regions that we may have to operate in, and then frankly have a more intelligent application of force, uh, again, whether it's to uh, relieve suffering or to compel behavior. Uh, it's that last piece when you transition from what we'll call tolerable instability, because we're not, we're not going to create you know, world peace, I don't believe. Uh, but we can, I think, be an important contributor to maintaining a degree of stability uh, that uh, is useful to U.S. interests and those of our allies. But there will be points where that stability is not going to be sustainable. And it's our ability to s rapidly transition into an expeditionary maneuver approach that will be important to being able to influence events at speed. Because when you think about how quickly the Arab Spring unfolded, uh, if you think about uh, how quickly events uh, occurred in Ukraine, uh, how quickly things have uh, changed in uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, our ability to be agile not only mentally but also physically is going to be increasingly important so that we can uh, get on top of events as part of a, a, a coherent, you know, political military uh, response to challenges around the world. So is that it, 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 the strategic maneuverability is one component of the big ideas, and an expeditionary maneuver. And we, the expeditionary the, maneuver. Yeah, the but it's, it's an infor informed. It's right. a, you know, informed is a key thing. We don't want to walk into something uninformed. There are some parts, places around the, the world, uh, where we're, you know, pretty well informed. Northeast Asia, Korea is a great example of that. Uh, we have not had a war there in the last 70 years. That's the ultimate outcome of, you know, and the desired outcome of maneuvering strategically is to be able to mitigate uh, conflict trends and prevent the really big things from happening. And then you'll have to deal with all the others, uh, the lesser included cases. And I think from that perspective, bringing the Marines, the Army, and SOCOM together uh, you know, kind of a common view of how to solve those problems is going to be very important <clears throat> because that gives, uh, between the three of us, that provides a policymaker with a whole host of uh, options to, to deal with, with challenges around the world and not within, you know, Marine Army and Special Operations stovepipes, but in more integrated uh, packages. If you look at how we've operated in Africa, uh, albeit in a non-conflict environment, uh, we've done a, a, I think, surprisingly good job of being very complementary. Uh, and I say we, I'm talking about the Marines and Special Ops and, and, uh, and the Army on that continent. And that's, you know, a near-term manifestation of what we're talking about in terms of maneuvering strategically.